Okay, cool. Uh, I'll get started. Uh, it's uh, actually, uh, I have quite a few slides to cover as well. So let's get started. Uh, my name is Girish and uh, I work for NVIDIA. Uh, so what I'm going to cover today is uh, how at NVIDIA we have accelerated uh, Kubernetes pod networking. Uh, you know, Kubert pods, regular pods, uh, any kind of network traffic uh, that starts on the pod or the pod receives it, pod to pod, pod pod to pod, pod to not, you know, any not so traffic, any east-west traffic, uh, any traffic uh, to which we apply Kubernetes network policies, uh, load balancer traffic, uh, traffic that involves natting, denatting. So anything that involves uh, pod as a source, pod as a sink, pod as a source, pod as an external world, uh, other way around, everything gets accelerated at wire speed uh, with all the networking services like fire, firewall, natting, and everything gets accelerated. So why is that it's very important for us for right so the workflow that we run uh, uh, is uh, very sensitive to delay so what we do is we have uh, this uh, graphics that we need to stream off of the cloud or to the end consumer uh, and the consumer could be uh, consuming the stream traffic on a phone on a old laptop uh, 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 you know on a desktop it could be anything on the on the receiver side but on the center side, it's uh, we are streaming off of the cloud, and and then as you all know, video streaming uh, is very sensitive to uh, packet drop or delay, jitter, you know, variance in delay, and sometimes we also uh, throughput is important. But uh, you know, so all of these things matters for us uh, where we run this work matters for our workloads that we run on the cloud, uh, and then also some of this uh, workload that we run on the cloud. Um, it's multi-tenant, like on a single bare metal node, we run multiple instances of this workload. Each workload could be assigned to an untrusted user out there. Uh, there are chances that this untrusted user could escape out of that container and then end up on the bare metal node itself. And once they're on the bare metal node, they can, uh, uh, you know, they can kind of escalate and then do pretty bad, bad damage. So we need to protect ourselves against that too. So it's not just uh, accelerating the uh, traffic from these workload uh, through the DPUs. I'll talk about what the DPUs are, uh, but also protecting ourselves for any kind of a container escape that might happen. Uh, so with that, uh, so I'm going to start off uh, with uh, uh, what network interface cards are and then how Kubert networking works and how we use it internally. And then how we're going to accelerate all of the traffic that I said at the same time get security using uh, a, a layered architecture that we use that's called as uh, NVIDIA ST. Yeah. Uh, and this layered yeah. architecture is completely uh, dependent on uh, all the open source uh, components out there. So at the very bottom, we have OBS, Open Virtual Switch. On top of the OBS, we have OBN, which is Open Virtual Network. It's the STN control plane. And this STN control plane needs to be programmed, right? Somebody has to tell it how to work. So that is where the oven Kubernetes CNI uh, that we have written. Uh, it's also open source. Uh, for all of these projects, we have been working with uh, Red Hat, uh, VMware, uh, eBay, quite a few folks out there for each of these uh, layers of uh, 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 open source software that we use. Uh, once, we, once I explain all these things, uh, then I'll make a point as to how this gets offloaded to the DPU uh, uh, by, by kind of capturing DPU as a bump in wire accelerator. And then we talk about, I'm going to talk about uh, how we're using multi-home pod, a cubeboard pod with multiple network devices, how each device is backed by uh, network attachment definition and how we are applying security groups for each of the uh, networks that cubeboard connects to, cubeboard pod connects to. And finally, how space that we plug into a cubeboard pod is already lagged. How are we using bonding in hardware to provide high availability to the interfaces that connect to the pod itself. So a lot of ground to cover. So let's get started. Um, so there are various kind of NICs. I just want to make sure I'm still not talking to myself. Um, uh, am I audible, right? Okay, I'm assuming it says. Um, um, so yeah, NICs, right? The various kind of NICs out there. So you have a regular NIC. Uh, wherein uh, it provides basic acceleration, like TCP IP acceleration. It will provide you with SROV virtual functions and, uh, uh, you know, maybe VXLAN, uh, NCAP, DCAP in hardware, right? Like uh, very basic uh, features like that. TCP IP acceleration, SROV VS to the VMs or container uh, and any, any switching between the VM and the, any switching between the VM 
or between the VM and the external network happens uh, in the hardware. Uh, sorry, happens in the hypervisor, right? There's a cost associated with it. Uh, everything happens in a, a hypervisor. Um, so that's the regular NIC. So in the next uh, uh, NIC layer of NICs uh, where the smartness gets added is the part where uh, all of this acceleration happens, right? The switching between the VMs, between the VM and the external world. So all this acceleration happens uh, on the NIC itself. Uh, so these are ASIC-based smart NIC. Uh, however, the control plane itself for the SDN, uh, the, the software components that's responsible for uh, running the control plane is still in the hypervisor, right? Uh, only the data plane got pushed to the hardware. The control plane is still in the hypervisor. But nevertheless, for the data plane, we get all the benefits of the offload. The next generation of NICs, uh, what they do is basically they move everything, the data plane as well as the control plane, into an operating system running on the smart NIC. Uh, the smart NIC has two components to it. Uh, it has a bunch of ARM cores, which runs an OS, uh, like Ubuntu or RHEL or whatever it is. And then it has a, a network uh, chip on it to accelerate the data path. So on the operating system, you run the control plane. On the network chip, you accelerate the hardware. On the hypervisor itself, nothing runs. So if this VM or container, if somebody escapes out of this VM or escapes out of the container and ends up on the hypervisor, there's nothing that the person can do with regard to the networking uh, control plane or data plane because everything got pushed into this uh, NIC, NIC uh, called the data processing unit or the SOC-based smart, smart NIC. It got pushed here. So there's nothing on the hypervisor for the attacker to do uh, anything there, right? The, he, cannot, he or she cannot flush the IP table rules. He or she cannot modify the switching because everything got... Uh, you know, pushed to, push to this uh, uh, hardware called data processing unit. And we have several generations of it. Uh, we are right now at Bluefield 2 version 2 uh, with, Bluefield 2, with Bluefield version 3 coming up next. So these are the various NICs. Um, and this particular table captures uh, what uh, a particular category of NIC is capable of. Uh, right, regular NIC can do basic TCP IP acceleration, right, uh, TCP checksum uh, and IP checksum, UDP checksum, you know, GRO, LSO, all those things it can do at, at the NIC level. Uh, it can do a VF, it can do VXLAN virtualization. So on the next level, next next category of NICs here, uh, we do Geneva, Geneva is a new uh, uh, extension. I mean, it's a pretty uh, a nice extension to VXLAN and then it's also used for overlay networking, for network virtualization. You take a physical network and you carve it out into multiple virtual networks so that you can do multi-tenancy off of it. So each tenant would get its own virtual network. Uh, in that way, the tenant itself is in its own island. Um, and then that network virtualization, VXLAN, it's like, uh, uh, you know, gives you uh, uh, an ability to create uh, millions of uh, such virtual networks. Geneve kind of extends that further and then gives you an ability to do, it has a variable in TLVs and then it has, it has a, a nice extension to do much beyond uh, just carving out physical network into multiple virtual network. Uh, uh, again, the ASIC based smart thing can do a few other uh, acceleration, but where the DPU or the smart NIC shines is uh, uh, that ARM, ARM thing that runs on the, on the OS, on, on the NIC itself, where you can push some of the control plane of SDN into it. And then you can also run some uh, network services uh, on it, right? So you could, you could say that any packet uh, from the wire hitting the host or the bare metal node goes through this uh, smart NIC. And then you can inspect that, inspect that packet for uh, firewall purposes. You can inspect the packet for intrusion detection. You can inspect the packet for uh, uh, you know, deep packet inspection and for DDoS, like you can run a SYN proxy there uh, to handle TCP SYN act, uh, attack. So you can do a bunch of things because this particular smart NIC becomes a bump in the wire for all the packets hitting the Kubernetes node. So that's the uh, uh, promise of the smart NIC. Now let's look at Kubert, right? So how does Kubert work? Kubert networking uh, provides uh, multiple ways to provide networking. So the one that we use internally is the bridge networking. Uh, we basically yank out the IP from the ETL zero that's assigned to the pod and then queue that IP directly uh, to the compute container running inside. In our case, this VM could be a Linux VM. It could be a Windows VM. Uh, and so we have a Vertio front end and we have a Vertio back end added to the bridge. 
the way you specify this networking is here in the in the VM uh, YAML file under the spec. You would define uh, the devices, the network devices. In this case, a single home, uh, and then and then and then the device itself is backed by the Kubernetes network called default oven primary here. So this default oven primary itself is a net network attachment definition, uh, and then it's a cluster-wide network attachment definition. So any regular pod or the Kubert pod that gets launched in your cluster will, by default, get an interface uh, on this particular network. And this network itself is backed by Oven Kubernetes, which is at the topmost layer of our STM tag stack. So at the very top, you have Oven Kubernetes. Uh, it talks to OVN, which is the middle layer, and the OVN itself talks to OVS. And I'm going to talk about each layer uh, very soon. Um, an extension to this Kubert networking is a multi-home networking. So in, in this case, we have uh, a web VM. Uh, one leg of the web VM is exposed directly to the internet. So anybody wants to, like a weather.com, you know, wants to check your weather, you just come in here and then you directly come into the web VM directly to this network interface. Um, and then this particular VM also has an access to a storage network with a different MTU, different network characteristics, right? And and then uh, uh, and then you have a third uh, in interface. The the first interface, the primary interface, is the interface that is the cluster wide uh, uh, interface, right? So this is a multi home Kubert pod. Uh, and uh, in the YAML spec file, we see that uh, we have three devices, network devices that we have called for, and each network device we are saying what is the backing network attachment definition. So we have public NAT which has MTU of fifteen hundred. We have storage NAT where you want to run Rocky. Uh, the jumbo size is set to 9K, and you have uh, the primary network uh, where you would run your control plane, right? This web stack has its own control plane, uh, you know, um, where it uh, talks to readies or whatever it is. So it, that's where this thing runs on. So basically a simple example of a multi-home pod where each network has different characteristics. So in the example here, uh, they're all backed by SROV CNI where it plugs a VF directly to the pod. So... Uh, this SRVF is off of a regular NIC, so you only get TCP IP acceleration and few other things, but you won't get uh, the entire uh, network traffic uh, 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 offload uh, as such. Um, so uh, this particular uh, slide connects the web VM to a database VM and then completes the picture. On the other side, the database VM also is a multi Home, uh, it has an interface uh, to connect to the storage network with a MTU of 9K, and then, um, and then you know uh, the the cluster wide network connects uh, both of these VM at ETH zero, and then of course the web VM continues to to the VLAN. And as you can see, there's a tenant VRF where uh, uh, all of these VLANs are interconnected, and uh, we have to uh, yeah. So that's the yeah. So this is. For every network you create, it's a complex uh, onboard process. You have to create VLANs, you have to connect them to VRFs, you have to apply the ACLs on the VLAN gateway interface. So if I have to protect, uh, if I have to say that, hey, this particular, on this storage interface, the only traffic that uh, is enabled is UDP Rocky, then I can, sh uh, I, I know I have to go to the gateway interface of this or maybe on the on this particular port and then apply the ACL on the switch itself. So it's very um, you know, it's not a self-service model. A lot of people involved. You have network fabric engineers involved to configure the switch on the on on the on the underlay, and then you have to configure ACLs itself inside the web VM, right? If uh, if somebody escapes out of uh, the web uh, Apache server, now they are on this uh, VM. They can flush all the IP table rules that got applied on the edge here. So that's not a very good uh, situation to be in. So uh, the takeaway here is that ACLs are applied on the VM uh, and that our, our, our ACLs are applied on the switch and it's not a self-service model. So that's, the, uh, that's where we were uh, a few years back and we changed everything by moving to DPU and then moved the whole thing to a service model, a self-service model without any VLANs. Uh, just making sure all the time. Okay, so so to create uh, the, you know, we depend on OBS, OBN and CNI, right? Uh, let's click go to OPS. OPS is a open. It's an open source model. A lot of people are counting to it, uh, and uh, this is uh, the GitHub where the OBS code resides. What is the premise of OPS, right? OBS uh, uh, basically runs in two mode. One is uh, um, it, it. It's like a in this simple mode. What it uh, what it is is 
a simple uh, a bridge. It's a simple layer to bridge, which figures out, it does the Mac learning, right? It, it, a packet comes in through port zero. It says that port zero has Mac address M zero, and then it does not know the destination Mac M one. It just floods it. And then when some when someone replies back to that uh, R request, now it notices that M1 MAC address is behind P1, right? So it's basically um, a simple learning bridge uh, uh, in, in one of the modes, right? So you basically create the bridge, you add all the pods to it or VMs to it or containers to it. And then in this normal, uh, you add one open flow rule uh, with action normal, and then you have a simple MAC learning switch. Uh, OVS has a bunch of components that run on it. Uh, it has a user land component and a kernel component. So in user land, you have a database which keeps track of all the bridges created, the ports uh, behind this uh, on the bridges. So this is where the database comes in. And this is the brain where uh, Mac learning kicks in, um, right? In a, in a complicated uh, flow, uh, I have an example here where um, where we use what is called as uh, open flow tables. And then within the open flow table, we use rules. What is an open flow, right? Open flow is a simple rule which says uh, it has a match and an action. What is a match? Match is a series of key value pairs which says it, you can match the incoming packet on the port the packet came on, uh, on the, the, the MAC address of the packet, the IP address of the packet, the L3 information, the L4 information. Once you match it, you can apply an action. Action could be to uh, drop the packet. It could be to forward the packet. But in this example, all I'm saying is all the packets coming from port three, right? All the packets coming from port three, just send it to P4 and all the packet from P4, send it to P3. So basically we have created an, uh, you know, a back-to-back -back connected setup where a pod or a VM connected to P3, uh, all the packets from that will end up on P4 and all the packets from P4 will end up on P3, right? As simple as that. Uh, the other one, it's a more complicated uh, example here, which, uh, um, provides you with a VLAN, you know, it's a VLAN capable and also does a Mac learning. So here, instead of using an action equal normal, we have four tables and within each table, there'll be a bunch of open flow rules. And, and then uh, when a packet comes in on one of this port, it starts from table zero, next goes to table one, table two, table three, table four. And finally, we decide what to do with the packet, right? So this is called a pipeline, right? A pipeline is a series of tables and then each table has a bunch of flows. A packet starts from initial table, and then it can skip ahead. It can go back and forth. We can recirculate the packet to table zero. So you can do a bunch of things, and it's a very powerful flow, flow pipeline, okay? So this is what, so, so this is what the smart NICs out there. There are a bunch of smart NICs out there. One of them is from NVIDIA. There's Netrodome. There are quite a few smart NIC vendors out there. What they have done is they have offloaded these flows, this open flow rules into the hardware. So what uh, we have done is before, right? Like what would happen is when the packet comes in here on the port, it would, uh, initially we don't know what to do with it. So what we, what we initially did was we would punt the packet to the OVS vSwitch D daemon running, on, running in the user space, right? So we just... So the packet comes in, we don't know what to do with it because it's a very fast packet for the traffic. We punt it to OVS vSwitch T. OVS vSwitch T decides what to do with the packet. And then it pushes the flow to the kernel so that the subsequent packets for the same traffic will hit the flow already pushed to the kernel. And then everything works off of the kernel. We only have the hit first time for the new traffic coming in uh, the, where the packet is copied to the... But all the subsequent packets and gets matched the kernel. So what the smart NICs do is they take it further where the kernel through the driver of the NIC, we push that flow, the kernel flows directly to the hardware. The first packet comes in, it goes to the OVS V switch T. The OVS decides what to do with the packet. It pushes the flow to the kernel. The kernel uh, pushes the flow through the uh, device driver into the hardware. All the subsequent packets now hit directly to the, go to that to the E switch. So there's no kernel involved, no research involved. There are some occasions where we cannot push the hardware because the action is not supported by the hardware. We still do it in the kernel. We wait, 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 wait. go to the vSwitch D. For all the cases where everything gets done in the kernel, uh, we have very low latency. We have very high bandwidth. And uh, obviously the CPU utilization is very, you know, because everything happens in the hardware, the CPU is left behind for other applications to use. Um, 
So, so this kind of goes into a step detail. What is that that we are offloading, right? So OBS flows gets offloaded, and then uh, we are using again uh, Linux standard. What uh, what uh, the upstream community and the folks at uh, Nvidia and few other folks at other vendors they all work together to offload uh, op uh, offload the TC the Linux kernel TC rules into the hardware. The all the open flow rules uh, that OBS uses gets translated to Linux kernel PC. So basically, the, it's the Linux kernel PC that gets offloaded. The open flow rules gets mapped to the TC. So any other application out there, if, it, if they can write to TC, they can benefit from all the CPU savings and the hardware acceleration that uh, the, the NIC vendors provide uh, 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 directly. It doesn't have to be OBS. It could be also to the Linux kernel PC. Okay, now we've we started with the two node. We're starting our journey with two node cluster in the DC where OBS is running on every node. And then OBS is running in a, it's not running in a normal mode. It's running with the uh, ability to run an open flow pipeline. So somebody has to now tell how that pipeline should be. And that's where the OVN comes in. OVN is this open version network that sits on top of the OBS. It's a distributed SDN control plane. It has a global view of things. So uh, here, what we are doing is that um, on the on the right side we have we define logical network, right? We we have a one to one mapping uh, between the physical entities to a logical entities, right? So here we have created two different logical topologies, right? In the one simple uh, instance here, we have a purple tenant. The purple one tenant want to create three different uh, VMs, and then they just want layer two network for the VMs. They don't care about routing. They don't do anything else. They just want layer two between these three VMs. So this is a logical top switch, create bunch of logical ports and then name them as VM A, VM B and VM C. You have a green tenant here, which they, they want an LP routed network. So they have uh, three logical switch and the logical switch themselves are connected by the router. Each logical switch uh, have a bunch of VMs connected to it. So this is your intent, right? There are two tenants with a different logical topology and this is network virtualization for it, you right? So your virtual network one, virtual network two. We are going to layer this virtual network on top of a common physical network, right? You have two bare metal nodes. It could be a Kubernetes node. It could be OpenStack. So these two uh, nodes are uh, um, uh, in your data center. They all are connected to the same physical network. Now we want to uh, virtual, you know, want to place two different logical topologies on the same physical network and then thereby declare network virtualization, right? So that's what's happening here. So in this thing, VMA, the, the purple tenant, uh, VM send it up on two different hypervisor. And then the green tenant, uh, VM send it up on two different hypervisor. So these VMA cannot talk to VM2 because if you look at the logical topology here, VMA and VM2, there is no route for it, right? It's just a layer two segment. And VM2 cannot uh, talk to VMA for the same reason. But uh, all of the green VMs can talk to each other because we have a router between the logical switches. So by that, the extension, uh, all of the VM is uh, isolated. All of the purple VMs are isolated. All of the green VMs are isolated. On the same data center, we have achieved uh, um, you know, multi-tenancy uh, from the networking point of view. So let's extend this further. Uh, OVN uh, provides not just uh, an ability to create L2 segment, and not just uh, routing between the L2 segment, it kind of, uh, like I was saying at the beginning, it has one-to-one -one mapping for everything that's there out on the on the physical side of the thing, like uh, switch, physical switch maps to logical switch, physical router maps to logical router, uh, the VM connection point maps to logical switch port, like the devices maps to logical switch port. Uh, you can do ACLs, you can do load balancer, you can do DNS, you can do THCP, you can do a bunch of these things. I highly encourage uh, uh, people to kind of go um, look at the GitHub uh, page to understand more what OPN does, right? Now, uh, let's take a simple example here, right? Uh, let's say this is the thing I want. I have two logical switch and there's a logical router between the two logical switch. Logical switch zero has one logical port and logical switch zero has another logical port. LP zero has a M zero as a MAC address and IP zero as IP address. LP1 has M1 as a MAC address and IP1 as a. So how do we define it? So we first use our NP kernel command to create this logical topology. At this point, nothing has, excuse me, at this point, nothing has happened. You've just uh, used our NP kernel command uh, defined in the our database. 
that this is your intent this is my desired configuration nothing is you know other than that nothing has happened at we if you want to realize this logical topology we have to bind we have to bind a port a physical port to a logical port that's called port binding so when we bind it how do we bind it right so we have two hypervisor nodes here and then a vm0 came up on node 1 and then we say vm0's port binds physically to this logical port called lp0 so this act of binding is done using ovs command when we add a port to a ovs bridge p0 like that vnet0 in our case we bind it saying that hey this particular physical port has this particular la logical mapping to it and the moment you do this we have ovn control plane components running on the node that will talk to a centralized control plane and download all the flows all the logical flows for that particular lp0 like what should it be mac uh, mac address what should be ip address what should be the security group for it what should be the load balancer rules for it what should be the dhcp options for it so it download everything and then implements those uh, characteristics of a port as a open flow rules in this integration bridge so on this integration bridge we have the entire open flow pipeline implemented using 64 open flow tables the packet coming from this vm0 goes through those 64 tables implemented uh, on this integration bridge and accelerated using the smart nic and the packet the packet from this vm0 goes through the ACLs, goes through various other checks and then finally we decide whether it whether it wants to whether if we should allow it to talk to p1 or whether it should not be whether it should be talking to internet or whether it should be drop so this whole thing is implemented as a distributed control plane on the ovs integration bridge uh, as open flow rules so now extending that story or journey we had ping components to begin with which was on the ovs now we have added the ovn components in on the two nodes um in the data center we also brought in a third node because uh, uh, the ovn control plane has this database right so this is the database where our nbcatal command when we initially run the command and and then uh, uh, define our intent of the logical topology this is where we make call to it right this is where all of the information is stored uh, and then our controller remember i was saying that uh, there's an center uh, there's a component running on each of the node this is the our controller that is running on each of the node so this is the one that that kind of waits for any binding to happen the moment a binding happens through that obs vs cattle command right this command the oven controller jet and then talks to the southbound to say hey i have a new binding for port uh, lp0 logical port lp0 give me all the flows to it so it gets all the flows for that and then it translate that into open flow pipeline and with that we have plumbed the end to end flow between this vma talking to this vmap and this all all of these things is um, sent over a overlay network see the network virtualization when i was talking about all of this inter vma talking to vmb or vma talking to vmc or vm3 talking to vm2 all of this thing is not happening over vlan it's not happening over vxlan it's happening over what is called as a overlay network uh, where um, we we take the packet from vm3 the ether, ethernet packet from vm3 we put it in a tunnel and then we send it on to the other end of the tunnel where the vm2 is running right and then the packet is uh, de encapsulated on the other end and then finally vm2 sees the packet from vm3 so the end to end packet uh, is actually uh, through a tunnel that gives us a lot more flexibility because uh, we do everything on the edge on the network fabric itself all we need is a pure l3 ip transport and we don't care much about the network fabric itself it gives us more power to innovate on the edge through software uh, through offloads and then network fabric becomes pure ip transport so we don't have to wait for like 18 months or 2 years for any for a for a switch vendor to give us all this uh, offloads on the on the network fabric we are innovating on the edge so this is how we have now two layers we have ovs at the bottom and ovn at the top So the next thing is to bring in a CNI, right? Somebody has to configure the not bound with that logical topology, right? I gave an example with Amon and Picado. Uh, there is uh, OpenStack uh, by default now uses OVN as its uh, uh, SDN con SDN control plane, and uh, Amon Kubernetes CNI is an extension to that. 
which kind of talks to the north node to define the logical topology. So I'm going to explain or give a quick overview of how the logical topology looks like for our Estian control plane. So Avan Kubernetes is again open source project. This is the third open source project that we are using. Of course, if you count Kubernetes, it's the fourth one. But from the networking point of view, this is the third one that we're using, which is the topmost layer. Uh, it's built on top of Open OBS. It is the one that talks to the Avan to define the logical topology, right? And and then in or in uh, this is the mapping. So every Kubernetes resource that applies to networking, like Kubernetes Pod, Kubernetes Service, Kubernetes Network Policy, uh, Kubernetes East West. Uh, uh, traffic, everything maps one to one very nicely with Avan resources. Kubernetes network policy, uh, you know, maps to Avan ACOS, uh, you know, uh, Kubernetes service maps to Avan load balancer, right? You have a load balancer, and then it denats to backend pod IPs. So the VIP, the Avan VIP is a Kubernetes cluster service IP. The backend IPs are uh, the pod IPs. So that's the load balancer. A pod maps to logical switch port. Uh, and, and then various other things. I'm not going to. Um, so this is this is a logical topology. We have a three-node Kubernetes cluster. The Oven Kubernetes CNI uh, has created logical switch for every Kubernetes node, and every pod that gets scheduled on that node will have an IP address from that logical switch. If these two pods talk to each other, it will get switched through this logical switch. If this pod wants to talk to another pod. Then we have to bring in a logical router, right? Which interconnects this logical switch. If this pod wants to talk to the internet, right? So it kind of goes through various logical uh, entities and then finally hits this gateway router where we source NAT it, source NAT it to the Kubernetes NAT IP. And then finally we send it to the network fabric. And network fabric uh, takes care of uh, sending it to uh, a gateway appliance, a firewall appliance, uh, where we source NAT again and send it to internet. And the reply, fi reply packet comes come. back to that uh, firewall appliance. And from the firewall appliance, it's sent to this node. At that point, it goes back to the OVN pipeline. And then finally, we kind of unsnat it. And then the pod, we get the pod IP back. And then the pod uh, and the packet to the pod goes, goes back, retraces the packet through these logical entities, like a logical switch to gateway router to join logical switch to logical router to finally to the pod. So all of this, because it's a distributed control plane, right? All of these logical things, which has a corresponding open flow table rules, they all reside locally. The packet is, no, when the packet moves from this logical switch to logical router to join logical switch to this gateway router, they, the packet is not moving out of the, it's not moving out of the uh, hypervisor. It's just moving from one open flow pipeline to another open flow pipeline to another open flow pipeline to another open flow pipeline finally where it gets sourced on it and sent out so it's just that all of these things is happening in the hardware uh, through various open flow tables and various open flow rules on it finally when we decide to source on it and send it out that's when the packet leaves the pod and then hits the wire towards the firewall appliance that connects the data center to the internet so i'm not going to uh, go over all of these things. The slide is made available for everyone. For any CNI out there which calls itself as a CNI, it should fulfill at least this bare minimum eight flows that Kubernetes networking tenants, what they call as Kubernetes networking tenant. So this particular diagram shows how various traffic flows in Kubernetes networking is actually uh, being fulfilled um, uh, by OVN. And, and then that itself was configured through this logical topology by Avan Kubernetes. Okay, finally, in our journey in the data center, we have added the red components, which is the Avan Kubernetes component, which configures the green component, which is the Avan component. And, and then uh, finally, the OBS component, which runs on every DPU uh, or every node, and that gets offloaded. And at the end of this, uh, three components together, we get a, a completely, uh, multi-tenant solution where every tenant has its own logical topology. They are in their own island. Tenant A cannot talk to tenant B because they're in their own island of logical topology. And these two tenants can be on a shared fabric, network fabric in the data center. And this was all made possible by the open source components and accelerated by the Metanox DPU, NVIDIA DPUs and NVIDIA partners. So, how does DPU fit into this picture, right? So let's go into it. So 
let's look at the host without a DPU, right? This is the host with the DPU. And remember the ping components with the OBS and uh, the, the OVN on top of the ping. And then you have, open. see all of these components were running directly on the x86 host. In the case of DPU, we run all of this control plane components round directly runs on the blue field too. And then we run a very thin, small plugin like a SRV CNI plugin to plug a VF on the x86 host. Everything got moved here. So it becomes a bump in the wire. So if you have a pod running here and if somebody escapes out of this pod and they're on the host, like in this case, they're on the host. Now, if they escalate themselves to a root privilege, now they have all of these things to play with it, right? They can go chain the open flow rule here to allow themselves to talk to, to talk to something else or install some backdoor, back, back, uh, backdoor process uh, and then have everybody in the internet or ev everything in the internet to talk to themselves because they punched a hole themselves. But in this model where we pushed everything to the DPU, if a pod escapes out and they're trying to do something, there's nothing that they can do other than just restarting the DPU, so restarting the host itself because the entire control plane, the obvious components of it, the OVN components of it, and the various other things just got moved to the integration bridge. So I'll come back and explain more on this uh, if I have time. I okay, I'm like uh, 30 minutes. Okay, so so this is the premise of the whole thing, right? DPU bump in the wire where things the SGN control plane move to it, and the entire uh, each of the pod in the case of no DPU, each of the pod would or the cube word would get a wet, and then uh, uh, and the whole end cap D cap would happen on the CPU of the host. The CPU would be busy, you know, one or one or two cores would be occupied just to doing end cap and decap. But in this, um, the pods minimally get a VF into it. The cubert pod or a regular pod minimally gets a VF into it, and then every packet going through this VF, they end up on the network chip on the Bluefield two. It gets offloaded, so uh, there is a lot of CPU savings on the x86 host because we don't do any end cap. In that, we do nothing. We do nothing. CPU bound from the networking point of view on the host because everything just moved to the Bluefield 2. On the Bluefield 2 itself, we accelerate everything. So I'll get back to this diagram and talk more to it as to what this uh, VFX and VFI are. Um, just, I want to just make sure. So this particular slide just talks to whatever I explained. And um, this is how our data center looks like. Uh, so you have a bunch of DPUs. Um, uh, they're all connected uh, to an underlay, right? This orange thing is an underlay VLAN. Blue thing is underlay VLAN. The green thing is an underlay VLAN. Uh, sorry, the red thing is an underlay VLAN. The green thing is the one um, uh, which is the overlay pod networking. It gets, uh, uh, you know, uh, it kind of gets um, encapsulated or tunneled over the orange VTAP network, right? All the packets from, a, if you're, if you're on the if you're on the wire snooping, you wouldn't see directly this IP packets. You would see that these packets encapsulated within this VTAP network using GNU as a protocol, right? So this is how. Um, and then, uh, yeah, let's look at uh, the cell service part of it, right? Um, so in here, we're going to now go back to the diagram that we had before. What's happening is that for every kind of a network that we care about, we have defined a OLA network for it, right? We had a primary network, which is a cluster-wide default network. And the uh, and to the Qbert port itself, we are plugging a VF. And then of course, uh, because there is a, a Qbert bridge in here, we do a, a you know, Vertio front end back end kind of a thing here. But the two other interfaces is through OVN. And uh, each cloud here has its own logical topology. There's a separate set of logical topology for this, separate set of logical topology for this, and a separate logical topology. There are three different logical topologies. There are like a rails on a railway track. They don't talk to each other. They're their own cloud. And then now um, all of these things going through this has a different MTU. And then we've extended, uh, uh, we have written uh, Kubernetes multi-network policy custom resource where Tenants can come in and then say that on this net zero interface, I want only Rocky protocol, Rocky UDP protocol to be talking to, you know, this DBBM. And everything happens on the edge, on the DPU. There is no network fabric, no network engineer involved. Everything happening on the edge through a self-service multi, you know, Kubernetes CRs. 
and this all open source by the way uh, in the avant kubernetes cni upstream so everything happens with self service model here um so like i was saying right here remember this part i explained at the beginning a pod with a single network will get all this logical topologies now this is a multi home pod with uh, the second network belonging to the overlay network for example a storage network so they get their own logical services logical resources you have logical switch per node and these logical switch they all interconnect and then such a logical router so so this particular this i'm extending these two clouds i'm i'm kind of uh, uh, jumping deep diving into this cloud and this cloud in this diagram here so the light gray is the cluster wide logical topology and the dark gray is uh, the second network and these pods connect to these two networks okay um so the thing is what is everybody knows what a bonding is right a bonding is basically you have two particular ports and you bond them together not just for throughput uh, but also for if one of the port goes down either on the on the host side or on the switch side all of the traffic is kind of moved over to the second port so you will still have the high availability and also uh uh, uh extend it throughput so how bonding has been working so far is that when you bond the interface you would have to take the vf from each of them and then give two vf to the pod right to the host vm or a container and then run bonding inside of it so every vm will have to do bonding twice uh, sorry they have to do bonding every vm will have to do bonding in their own vm but in the case of um, vf flag what we do is we bond the the two ports on the dpu itself and any vf you create it's already vf flag so you give just the vf into the kubert vm now the vf you don't have to do bonding anymore inside the vm the 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 ports itself on the dpu is bonded together in hardware if one of the port dies the vf can still continue to use the other port to send the traffic out so what the power of this is if you have 100 vms kubert vms running on a single bare metal node each of the vm having one vf assigned to it you don't have to do bonding individually inside of the vm the bonding is done for you on the dpu uh, the way it works is uh, the same open flow rule is added to both the e switch that belongs to port 0 and another e switch belongs to port 1 when this port 0 dies the rules are already there here and and then it will be seamless transfer for this vf let's say this vf 0 was going through e, e switch e switch 0 going out right but this port dies now because the rules are there on both the switch uh the vf 0 will not see a glitch at all it just continues to send the packet through the port 1 through e switch 1 so this is another uh useful there are so many other things that i can talk to but uh, for in the given 50 minutes uh i hope that um, this was very useful and uh, uh the two takeaways are um, that uh, security is one part of the solution uh, second is the whole hardware acceleration so if you have a workload out there um you know which is sensitive to latency jitter and what not uh, uh acceleration is key uh, security is obviously very important um and then there are quite a few references out there here which uh, you can go take a look at for a deep dive into this uh, some of the things that we uh, use dpus for and with that i would like to open this up for um, um conversation hello uh Can you guys hear me? Hello. Oh, okay, I had cool. my. So one of the question, um, yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry, I was just. Uh... So one of the question Chris was asking is that uh, you know, you know, Manas, if you were to come to Canada, we would love to engage with anybody just to assist with getting our information right. Sure. Uh, I'll uh, Chris, please reach out to me on my email ID. Uh, I'll uh, connect you with the right set of people who can help you out with that. Uh, thank you for the question, Chris. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, Q and A. Okay, as far as I know, uh, 
I think there's a question from Jian Lee. As far as I know, VF suffers from uh, portability issues, which makes VM live migration very difficult. SF might be a good alternative to resolve the issue. Does the presented solution also support SF? Yes, that's a very good point. Uh, everything I just said also uh, supports what is called as a SF, which is scalable function, uh, which is a very lightweight, uh, lightweight VF. Uh, it doesn't have a PCI device ID. The kind of uh, SFs are created off of VF and uh, uh, it, yes, it's possible. Everything I present today uh, works for SS2. Uh, Avan Kubernetes, the second question is, uh, Avan Kubernetes implements the Kubernetes networking model. I would wonder whether the proposed solutions support VPC model are targeted to Kubert. Um, I I have to confess, I don't know what the VPC model is for Kubert. Um, I will uh, read more about it and uh, get back to you on that. Um, is the Bluefield offering available on Connect X6? Yes, uh, the similar uh, Connect X6 is, uh, um, so Bluefield 2 is two part, right? It has ARM cores running on it and it also has a Connect X module on it. Um, so, so on the Connect X6, yes, all of the offloads I talked about uh, uh, is also supported there. Um, it's just that you don't get um, uh, a ARM core to run the uh, DPU services on. Uh, this, especially this particular slide, um, here, right? So you get all the offloads like OBS, you know, all of those things. You just don't get a way to run the control plane uh, because the control plane will be still running on the hypervisor. So all of the security aspect of it is still a challenge there. And you don't get the uh, ability to run, you know, a, a bump in the wire uh, service, like offloaded service, like firewall, uh, deep packet inspection, flow inspection, uh, you know, syn proxy, DDoS, the quite a few things that you can run on the TPU. You would lose out on that. Um, uh, again, th th James, thanks for the, thank you for the question. Um, what's a DPU? <laughs> so DPU is a data processing unit. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a SOC based uh, smart NIC. Uh, what do you mean? What do I mean by that is it's a one part ARM core with the OS running on it so that you can write script. You can write your own script. You can do a bunch of things. You can introspect, you can write telemetry. You can do a bunch of things on that OS. And then the second part, um, a network uh, embedded network chip. So that gets you flexibility to write. Um, it's like um, uh, what DPU does is that uh, every bare metal node that has a DPU on it, now the DPU becomes your next top, top of the rack switch. It becomes like a switch and you can write your scripting. You know, it's an OS, it's a full fledged OS. You can write any of your favorite, you can use any of your favorite language to write anything that you want to introspect into the traffic coming in. Um, there's a link in the uh, presentation slide that I have towards the end. It's called D -D Docker. I would uh, uh, encourage everybody to please go look at it. Uh, it's pretty awesome, actually. What we have done is Docker is um, DPU, uh, sorry, data center on converged arch architecture. So uh, the DPU itself uh, provides a ton of uh, libraries, and uh, you could write application that runs on the DPU using this library. Uh, to introspect into what's happening on the bare metal host. Like I was saying at the beginning of the meeting, a lot of our pods are untrusted. Like a single pod might have 100 people on it, and each of the 100 people are untrusted users. So it could be that the, one of the users jumped out of the pod, and then they ran a background process. They wrote a backdoor process, right? Using AppShield, we can introspect into a running memory of the pod, right? This AppShield itself, is, and this AppShield, can intros using a PCIe uh, magic, it can introspect into the running memory of the DPU, right? In the first call, you can get all the running processes and for every process, you can get all the threads on it. And then you create a hash of it. And then you onboard, onboard the user to do whatever they want to do on the pod. And every now and then you can go back and then get the same, get the new set of processes. And for every process, get a new set of thread IDs and compare that hash with the new hash. And if you see any small change, then you know that uh, the, the new uh, user whom we onboarded is running a background process or something and we can immediately terminate it. So that's the app shield. You can do deep packet inspection. You can do crypto. You can do a bunch of things on the DPU and there's APIs for it. It's all open source uh, thing. And uh, that's the power of um, DPU as compared to the CX6 card. Um, um, there's one more question. Um, 
Are you also considering integrating? Yes, uh, yes, that's that's in a, a plan. Uh, the uh, the DPU has this SPDK, where we can integrate some of those APIs into um, into Avon Kubernetes. Uh, uh, please uh, uh, raise an issue in Avon Kubernetes um, uh, GitHub page, and uh, uh, we as a community we're more than happy to work on it together. Uh, Red Hat team and us we have been working collaboratively for a very long four years now. So we have been working on this for a long. Will this presentation be available? Yes, it's available. And I think uh, uh, Andrew Burden will make it available. Thank you so much for that question. And I think uh, I'm one minute over my talk. Um, so is there any other uh, uh, question? What's the approximate CPU may overhead of for OVN in, in a, for a single Kubernetes server node? Um, so if it's just a single Kubernetes server node, uh, the overhead is very small, right? Uh, OVN, uh, we have been we have worked over the past two years to make OVN scale uh, uh, to thousand node cluster uh, within NVIDIA. The maximum node we run is thousand two hundred. We have a single Kubernetes cluster running up to thousand two hundred, and it's all managed through OVN and Avon Kubernetes and OBS, and everything offloaded. Um, so. Um, um, so uh, over the last two years, it was not that great, but over the last two years, we have fixed OVN uh, to scale well and, and uh, in terms of consuming less memory, uh, less CPU. Uh, 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 so I can kind of, if you can reach me out, I can provide you uh, offline, I can provide you with uh, exact numbers uh, if, that interests, if that helps you. Uh, again, thanks for the question. Cool. Uh, th thanks, everyone. I really appreciate all your questions. And again, thanks to Qbert for providing the opportunity to talk about it. There's quite a few things uh, that we do. Um, so happy to come back and uh, present on some of the other, uh, other things that we have been working uh, in an open source way uh, and so that uh, uh, others, others the community can uh, benefit and leverage from what we have done. Uh, thanks again.